Hang on, Joe. We've just got Richie Medhurst. Oh, <laughs> Richard, welcome. Welcome to the show. So glad that you could join us. Uh, uh, and uh, what is the, you said you were, do you have all your devices with you? Were you able to, uh, is that part of the reason why you couldn't join us earlier? Th thanks so much uh, uh, for having me on. It's really an honor. Yeah, that, that's the reason because I, they, they took my phones, they took my uh, wired microphone, my wireless microphones, um, they took uh, my headphones. So uh, all, all of the things I need to work, basically. And uh, yeah, it's it's impeding me and uh, slowing me down. So I'm, again, I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, they, they even admitted that they didn't need to take them, but they took them anyway. They said, oh, the evidence bag is sealed. So if you oh. buy that. Yeah. Well, so let's, uh, can you give us a a much more condensed uh, version of what happened to you. And I'm particularly interested in knowing if you can discuss it, what questions they asked you, what exactly were they trying to get at in your view? Well, I'm not at liberty, unfortunately, to yeah. d divulge the uh, nature of the questions that were put to me uh, because I'm, I'm out on bail technically. So, uh, you know, I could, I could still be charged. And um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, it is, it is quite, uh, astounding so you know we we landed and i already got a gut feeling that something was up when the plane was taxiing and stopped suddenly then uh there were six police one of them was uh, uh so basically five men and one woman and one of the men was dressed in like tactical gear so you know like counterterrorism uh, uh police um yeah yeah <laughs> make it, it look it, good it, make it look good yeah <laughs> yeah like and, a I knew something was up when they told me to come to the front of the plane. I, I knew it. Um, and they took my bags. Uh, they, uh, you know, when I asked why, the guy who took my bags was still in the plane. I thought he was maybe doing something with my bags. So I asked, what's going on? And then they accused me of stalling. So, you know, I, I, I just kept walking. They, they then arrested me uh, under Section 12 of the Terrorism Act. I think, I think I'm the first journalist to be arrested under Section 12. I know other people have been uh, arrested. Uh, but yeah, what, what a welcome home, really just... They put me in handcuffs, uh, despite me being completely calm and, and, and compliant. They put me in the paddy wagon, drove me to the station, uh, ransacked my bags in the lobby. You know, they uh, took out, you know, took everything apart um, and and then booked me and put me in a cell. And it was I mean, I just want to say something here. Forget me and like my story. I'm, I'm speaking in general now. No one, no one should be put in these conditions, even someone who is convicted of a crime. I mean, if you, you know, you're into archaic punishment, they should not be in these conditions. This was not a cell with a toilet. It was, it was just a toilet. You know, it smelled like urine. The, the bed is like a concrete ledge. You've got a mattress. It, there, there's barely any light. They don't turn it off when you sleep. Uh, there was no toilet paper. I mean, it's just it, re really barbaric uh, conditions. All right, Richard, this is that. inside Heathrow Airport, the jail? It's in the so airport? It, it's 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 Heathrow Police Station. It's about a ten minute ten minute drive, and uh, you you can imagine with my hands behind my back, uh, you know, I, I I was like almost falling over the whole time, and um, yeah. So uh, they also gave me special handcuffs with two locks, uh, and they your wrists they basically go on top of each other like this. So not not next to each other, but on top of each other. And I told you know I told them I want to see the nurse because of the marks. So you know it's documented, but uh, uh, that didn't happen. So. I mean, I did get seen in this later for something else, but um, yeah, it's like all the basic things, you know, I would say, for example, uh, uh, can you tell me if you've called a solicitor? Uh, can you, can I have some water? Um, you know, uh, can, can you tell me why I'm here? Can, I'm, I'm cold. Can I have a, a you know, um, a pullover or something? It, it's like, can I see the nurse? It, it's always you have to nag and then they'll say yes and then make you wait or just completely say yes and ignore you. You know, it's Richard, like, what was going through your mind when you were in that van going over and then when they threw you in the cell? What, before you talked to them, what were you thinking? I, I found it outrageous. What was happening? What do you think was happening to you? I, f I found this outrageous. I mean, they if you're arresting someone for terrorism or, you know, alleged terrorism offenses, you obviously you have an idea of their background and who they are and what they've done or supposedly done. And, and they know very well, you know, I'm a journalist. They know very well, um, you know, my, my parents are part of the diplomatic community. I mean, my father is, is an authority on counterterrorism. You know, the, the idea that I, that I support terrorism is, is ridiculous. It, it's absurd. And, and I, I knew I'm being targeted for my journalism. I, you know, I, I, I felt like uh, they're trying to make an example out of me and, 
And, you know, I even said, like, if, if you want to question me, let's just get on with it, basically. You know, like, there's no need to book me and put me in the cell because you know, I stay there almost 24 hours. Um, not, not, not in the cell 24 hours, but, it, you know, in general in the station. Um, and, uh, yeah, most of the time in their solitary confinement. And you're watched the whole time. You can't even go to the toilet, you know, you're, you, I mean, without being recorded, I, I, you know. And there's no toilet paper either. I didn't bother asking because, I, you know, I just assumed that, uh, you know. Uh, it's going to be like with the water and all these things. So, yeah, just, uh, you know, once again, I want to put this into context that even if you uh, think that someone has done something wrong, they should not be put in these conditions. I find this barbaric. I find this very authoritarian and designed to humiliate. And I, I saw other people being arrested in the station. You know, they were people of color. They, they you know, w one of them was on drugs or something. The guy, you know, people not, who are not doing well, they need to be in hospital. They need to be with doctors and nurses taking care of them, not thrown in, in you know, some rat hole like this. That's going to make them feel even worse. I, I just, I don't understand the logic behind any of this. And uh, when I was in the jail cell, you know, I, I felt like, um, I felt like, because they wouldn't tell me, right? But, uh, just to be clear, they would not tell me what I had done exactly. They just named the law. They said se Section 12. I, I didn't know what Section 12 is. I thought um, it was Schedule 7 that they were arresting me under. I thought they were going to question me immediately and all these things. So, you know, just to be clear, I, I spent like, I don't know, 13, 14, 15 hours until I was finally questioned. Uh, and it lasted just, you know, an hour, an hour and a half. So there, there was no need for this. If they had just invited me or you know sent a letter, I would have come down. You don't have to humiliate me and drag me off of a plane. But uh, they did. But they That's show. maybe the point, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I mean, they're targeting me because of my journalism. They want to make an example out of me. They, they're, they're escalating on all fronts. And, you know, all I've done, I'm, I'm just trying to provide a counterweight to mainstream media. What's the point of sounding like mainstream media? We, we don't need more journalists who sound like mainstream media. Now, I'm not obviously trying to be contrarian just for the sake of it. Right. But, uh, you know, I, I feel like I, I feel the mainstream media are dishonest. So all I'm doing is is just trying to shine a light on an issue that is very important on the Palestinian issue, uh, which Britain caused in, in the first place, uh, you know, almost 100 years ago. And Britain is still involved in that. So, you know, I have a, a, a duty as a journalist to talk about this because it's the most pressing news story. And also as someone who's British, I kind of I owe this to the Palestinians to make up, try and make up for what Britain has done to them. So you have no doubt that that's the particular journalism that they are concerned about. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I've been trying to figure out like what what exactly ticked them off, um, because recently, uh, the like the most recent things I did, I, I talked a lot about this gang raping scandal in State Eman. I talked I did an investigation on the Olympic athletes, uh, Israeli Olympic athletes and how they were, uh, you know, violating the neutrality and, and peace uh, mission of the Olympic Charter. And I also talked about um, something I, I can't remember yeah the massacre the, I mean, the twins you talked about yeah. the twins and right. the birth certificate and the, that was heartbreaking. i mean that was so low i mean low-key in fact you were you appeared to Not be very rapper. sad rapper, your mood yeah yes you you weren't antagonistic you weren't that was the last report you did before this happened and i wonder yeah. if that had something to do with it it just didn't even make sense yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I uh, I can't really put my finger on it because I'm also not allowed to to talk about the uh, the questions uh, specifically. Right. But uh, I I think just generally speaking, um, they've they don't like my reporting because for them it's like I'm a class traitor. You know, I I went to all the right schools. I was I was supposed to maybe become a diplomat or something, and I'm using all my tools uh, to to right. tell the truth instead of you know become a liar for the. For the uh, FCO. <laughs> so. Oh, I think they just they they don't like that more than like Craig Murray. We just we just had Craig on before you came here, uh, and Craig is a, considered a class trader as well. Right? He was yeah. he was diplomat, and he's what he's doing now. Was were you surprised? I'm sure in the back of your mind, and all of us now who are on in this in media that is dissident, we never imagined. I'm older than you, obviously, so I go back, and I could never. We always feared that someday. In a Western country, they could be the knock on the door, right? They can actually come and get you at three in the morning because something you wrote, because you what you wrote is threatening their power, their interests. And we, we always, I always, and Craig agree with me, we kind of dismissed that, that that won't really happen here, you know? And now we're seeing 
that it is happening now. So I'm wondering, you couldn't be completely surprised by this, but what was in the back of your mind? Did you ever fear that this would ever happen to you? Um, I again, I'm not I'm not quite sure how I should answer that or if I should answer that because you know I'm still being investigated. But uh, um, I, I suppose I I could maybe uh, quote some something that other people said. Perhaps just you know, as, 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 it's not me saying this, but they uh, basically said that you know if you you do get arrested uh, nowadays. Uh, that you're probably doing something right uh, as a journalist, so you probably expect it, if I can well, put in, it that in, way. In general, I'm speaking about uh, the state and and the freedom yeah. of speech and the media, and that the that what separated, what they continuously tell told us, and still tell us, that it's those other countries, China, yeah. Russia, Iran, not Saudi Arabia, of course, because they're friends with them. But those <laughs> countries that they don't like, they're the ones that will knock on the door at three in the morning because you run an article they don't like, and they're going to let you know about it. Former Soviet uh, bloc, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and, and growing up during the first Cold War, you know, I didn't necessarily believe that the U.S. was the most wonderful place in the world. But we, we didn't think this would really happen here. So mm -hmm. I'm just asking in general, you think this is happening now here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I mean... Joey you, you, and, and Kathy, I mean, all, all, all of you, you, you recall quite well how uh, Julian was persecuted. I mean, that by itself was, you know, that's the open and shut case of fascism. I mean, if, if, if there ever was one. So I, I guess, you know, I don't want to sound naive or something like that, but I guess I, I, I do. I, I, I did have this kind of uh, uh, thought that, you know, surely they won't go that far, you know. Because because already what they did to Julian was a scandal, and we you know we just finished with that. But now you can see a clear escalation, and and the fact that they arrested me, they didn't detain me, they arrested me and put me in a jail cell. You know, I mean, in a in a freezing urine, you know, stinking uh, a place. I mean, yeah, it's 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 really that bad now. It's like something you, as you said, you would expect from from you know the stereotypical bad countries. Well, I have bad news for everyone. It turns out we're the bad ones. Well, exactly. I mean, it's something again. I I didn't think would happen. Um, yeah. And it does show. It does show that they're reading what we write. Um, it's having oh, an yeah. impact. Uh, it also shows the weakness of their own positions, whether they are conscious of it or not. I think some people in government and in the establishment are very conscious and are very cynical. They know exactly that they're supporting a genocide. And yes, and how do they know it's a genocide? They, they know. They, but they're maybe you know they're pretending they're asking for the ceasefire as we're seeing in the American uh, Democratic Party trying to not lose their base. We've just lost Richard. You're back. No, he's back. Okay. Um, so they know the weakness of their position, and what we are writing here only up to and I'll just speak generally. So we're not talking about necessarily your case. Is something that worries them, and we've seen inklings of this happening. There have been various cases where PayPal's cut off, cut us off, Mint Press, et cetera. Small things going up to Scott Ritter just earlier this month, yeah. the FBI raiding his home. That's, that's trying... a scandal. And that's I think really it's all of a piece right now. And that's what's, what's tipped me over, the Scott case, and now what's happened to you is what tipped me over to thinking, man, it really is going on. Because I was always so reluctant. I don't want to be paranoid. I hate the F word being overly used, fascist, fascist. Yeah. Like, like the Trump is calling um, calling Harris a, a communist, and the Democrats are calling him a fascist, and these are words from the 20th century. Yeah, we need, new, <laughs> we need a new lexicon to describe the authoritarianism we're living in now. I don't think that's useful anymore, but um, people cling to it because that's like the worst thing you could say about somebody politically is you're a fascist, and from the other side, you're a communist. So, but again, I, this has tipped us over to this new situation that we're in, and uh, I'm. Stalling here because I can't ask you any specific questions about what you were asked, which is well, what I really wanted I, to get I, you. If if I could just uh, add a few things because I really I really do agree with what you're saying. They they've diluted and you know used these words so much that they have no meaning anymore. But I I, I just wanted to say um, in terms of treatment, you know, <laughs> uh, my my father was in the Met when when he was very young. Uh, I think as a teenager, started as a teenager for a few years before going to the UN. And, and so, you know, I know, like I even told them, I know, I know the, the tricks, you know, just get on with it. You, you, you're trying to intimidate me and all these things. So, um, you know, 
it, it, it's they, they they were very civil like, like just to be clear they were very civil and very cheerful that's the english way you know right. we'll smile and we'll smile in your and then stick a knife in, not in your back but in your stomach you know so um you it's like you know they kill you with kindness in a sense right but it, it, they make you wait for a cup of water like hours i mean i i, I don't want to sound dramatic or something but i, I again i'm I feel like this was bordering on like human rights violations, you know, like I don't, I shouldn't have to ask because the second, I mean, not the second they arrested me, but you know, shortly after I said, I, I've just got off the plane. I really need to go to the toilet. I really need water. Can I please have something? Okay. I'm in handcuffs. I'm, you know, at your disposal. So, you know, they say, yeah, yeah, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And then it's just like, it turns into hours and they, you know, I think that, that I don't know if that was just against me specifically, or they treat everybody like this either way. It's wrong. Um, our, our game. Yeah. It, 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 it's re it's really um uh so you know it's like adding insult to injury in addition to to the whole uh investigation and i'm i'm a victim of terrorism you know when my parents were in the un we were we were posted in uh islamabad for a while and the egyptian embassy that was right next to the british school where i i, I was in there when when the double bombing happened so you know i i know what terrorism is and i and i reject terrorism and the to come and, and arrest me and then you know, treat me like I'm I'm some armed uh, thug or something. I mean, this is really obscene, uh, really obscene. And the way they dehumanize you, like, oh, take off your shoes and take off your socks, turn the socks inside out. Can you hold them up for us, please? You know, and there's, and there's a group of police just like looking at your socks. And then can you show us your feet, please? I mean, like, you know, I thought I thought the things that I'm saying allegedly are the problem, not what, you know, so I'm hiding something in my shoes. I mean, this is, um, what can I say? Um, yeah, so uh, you're back in Vienna, that's correct? Yeah, so they released me on unconditional bail, gave me back my passport, and uh, I um, I have to come back uh, to the police station, uh, you know, in in, in, a while, in a few months. Um, and uh, yeah, they might, I don't know what's going to happen. They might drop it or they might charge me, so. Well, Richard, I mean, if there was anything that they could charge you with, they would have done it already. Yeah. So one can assume that you might be chilled, that you might not do anything for the next three months in case it 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 worsens your case. But what are you going to do for the next three months? Are you going to speak out or or what? <laughs> yeah, that, that that's that's the question. You know, uh, that's the question, Kathy. Because I I feel like um, that. I don't know how to how to say it, but um, I feel like they released me on unconditional bail uh, on purpose, in a sense, because they know it's not unconditional. They know that I have to shut my mouth, that, you know, I can't really do my job. And and, and that's the worst thing for a journalist, because, again, they didn't release me on bail, uh, you know, for shoplifting or something or burglary where you can kind of forego stealing or something, you know, for, for three months. It's my job to speak. It's my job to, yeah. to, to talk about what's going on. And the fact that I can't talk about what happened to me nor what's happening in in Palestine, I mean, I think that that's the, you know, the intention they want to, uh, they want to silence me, they want to muzzle me and also have, have a chilling, you know, make sure that it has a chilling effect on other people. So um, they don't have to charge you in order to uh, take away uh, your freedom of speech and to attack freedom of the press. So yeah, it, it, it is a good question. And the problem is not that I am doing anything wrong. The problem is that the law is so abstract. And so the, the threshold is so low that anything, you know, as innocent uh, uh, as can be, they can just skew it into something else. And, uh, you yeah. know, I, I don't think that's democratic. I, was, I don't think that's okay. I was talking to Craig earlier about that, about the, the particular language they use is reckless as opposed to with intent. So you don't even have to intend to promote this uh, uh, prescribed group if you just recklessly happen to make someone else feel that way potentially then you can still fall under this law which it seems to be completely beyond orwellian but i wanted to ask you about how um effectively this type of action against yourself and against other journalists in the uk um in the last few months and over the last few years like against craig murray click kick larenberg vanessa Bealey, uh, other people uh how to what extent is that really crippling independent truly independent journalism in the uk do you feel it's possible for a truly independent journalist to really operate there at this point no and it's not even just in the uk i mean I'm, I'm i'm english but i'm not living in the uk at the moment and yet i have to shut my mouth so you know yeah. the the 
uh, issue of jurisdiction here is very, very, very interesting uh, because uh, the, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I think that goes without saying. So um, they, this is the thing with these so-called uh, terrorism cases is that, you know, all bets are off. They can accuse you of anything. They can amplify it however they want. And then they permit themselves to also spy on you however they want and violate your human rights however they want. You know, it's 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 like a carte blanche. It's just a blank check for them to to go ahead and, and, and demonize people. And that's not what uh, uh, counterterrorism laws should be. Uh, uh, you know, it should be used for simply. Yeah, of course, there's some there's some reasonable things in the Terrorism Act to fight actual terrorism, of course. But, you know, historically, uh, we don't even have to look, uh, you know, um, that far back. You, I mean, the Terrorism Act itself is basically what they just renamed it um, after they used it in, for decades in Ireland against, uh, you know, to randomly arrest people. And, uh, you know, we, we all know what they did with the... Um, uh, with the Guildford and uh, uh, you know uh, four. case and uh, yeah yeah I, I want to say four and then I remember what happened to their families and it's like I lost count. That's <laughs> you know, right. That's, that, <laughs> that's the thing. It's so expansive and the powers are so sweeping. So we you know I I think it is important to draw a parallel uh, and to remind people that this is not a new thing. They've been using this against people in Ireland and similarly uh, in Palestine. You know a lot of the things that are happening in Palestine today, your house demolitions. Uh, with withholding bodies. Uh, the Israelis don't have their own laws for this. They're using British martial law from 1945. And they, they took this to their own Supreme Court and said, well, you know, yeah, it's still in effect. I mean, I'm not going to get into it. But my point here is just that Britain has a history of, you know, arbitrarily detaining people or detaining people unjustly and uh, accusing them of, you know, offenses of the highest order and, and trying to ruin their lives. And they don't necessarily even have to be journalists. So, you know, just to go back to your, your question, sorry, I drifted off a bit to there, but, uh, you know, if ju independent journalists can operate uh, normally, no, absolutely not. They want everybody to fall in line. You know, you, you can only have one opinion. It has to be the mainstream media's opinion, the pro-Zionist, the pro-Israel opinion. And, and I think it's scandalous, honestly, because um, anyone who's English and who, you know, who knows their history uh, would understand that uh, Zionists have nothing but contempt for England. I mean, they, uh, you know, the, the biggest terrorist attack against British subjects in history was carried out by Zionists. And uh, yeah. yeah, they, you know, the BBC won't tell you that. <laughs> um, Richard, have you, I mean, you're accredited by the International Federation of Journalists. Otherwise, I would never have met you in the Assange courtroom because we had to be accredited in that way. And possibly the NUJ, the National Union of Journalists as well. Have you been contacted by your unions? And uh, have you been contacted by, uh, well, have you consulted a lawyer as well to understand your position? So, you know, you know what you can do in the, in the coming months. Yeah, that, that's correct. I'm, I'm accredited by the NUJ, the IFJ, um, also, uh, you know, some, uh, also the Austrian Union and uh, the United Nations in Vienna. So uh, if, in terms of uh, if they contacted me, yeah, the, the NUJ contacted me, uh, which is which is great. And, and I appreciate that. And I'm, uh, I, I just I, I couldn't reply because, you know, my it's chaos right now. I don't have my devices and nothing is working. So um, hopefully we can do something there. And uh, uh, sorry, Kathy, I forgot the, the last bit of your question. You, you uh, asked about, um, you know, speaking to a, a lawyer as right. well. Yeah. So this is this is very interesting. So I assumed when I was arrested because, you know, I, I, I didn't catch uh, when they said uh, uh, Section 12. I just assumed it was Schedule 7, that they were going to question me immediately and then, you know, uh, make me hand over the password. So I didn't even bother, uh, you know, it didn't even cross my mind to ask for a lawyer. When we got down to the station, so about you know, 10, 15 minutes um, uh, later, I saw just randomly a poster on the wall that says, you need a solicitor. And I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna ask, just why not? And then I asked one of the police, uh, one of the arresting officers, and I said, uh, am I allowed to have a solicitor? I was expecting a, you know, to say no, uh, because I asked to contact my family and they explicitly said, no, your, your calls are withheld. You know, they gagged me basically. So uh, she said, uh, the way she answered it was so funny because uh, she said, well, yeah, you know, it's up to you. You can have one or, or not. You know, she made it sound like it's an, an optional thing on a dinner menu or something. <laughs> uh, and, and I found that now that I think about it, I, I, I'm, I'm just wondering when they arrested me, did they even mention that? Because they said, you know, anything I say can be used against me. 
I don't recall them mentioning that I can have a lawyer. Maybe it's just, you know, I, I just don't remember. Uh, so I don't want to say anything de definitively. But uh, yeah, so what happened is I was not allowed to speak to my family uh, or a friend or call, uh, you know, any, anyone to tell them I'm there. And they gave me a pamphlet. They gave me a piece of paper with, you know, police conduct. And, and the first thing that it says is that you have the right to tell someone that you're locked up. So I was holding it up to them uh, and saying, it says here, I have the right to tell someone that I'm here. And you just told me that verbally. Why can't I, you know, call anyone? And they said, well, you know, uh, uh, it's not an absolute right. It can be withheld. It can be waived. And I was just stunned. I was like, it's, I'm not even going to bother arguing with them. They're like, you know, primary school teachers or something. So the second thing on the, on it was that you're, you're allowed to have a, um, you're allowed to know why you're locked up. So again, I, I asked them like, what is schedule, uh, sorry, what is section 12? And, and what organizations are, uh, you know, alleged organizations are you talking about? And they said, oh, you know, we'll, you'll find out later or they'll be, they'll question you soon. Um, I mean, yeah, so, you know, they didn't comply with those things at all. Um, mm -hmm. And it just goes to show you how not only obscene the terrorism act is in the sense that you're accused of something that you haven't done, but also that they they violate, you, you know, basic tenets of, of, of English law and, and human rights, you know, that you can contact someone, just tell them you've been arrested. So I, I was sitting in there for hours and hours in the jail cells. Like no one even knows I'm here. No one, no one, no one has a clue what happened to me. Mm. Um, and uh, I asked them for a solicitor uh, when they were booking me. Uh, as, as I said before, I, I, I saw the poster and then I asked them and I, I gave them a couple of names and I had to keep asking like, you know, because if someone would come and check on you in the cell uh, every, I don't know, 45 minutes, they, you know, pull the slit down and just look. So I'd ask, they'd ask, are you okay? And I'd say, well, no, because I'm not allowed to speak to my family and, and uh, I need a solicitor. Did you call a solicitor? And they'd say, well, uh, your calls are withheld. And then I'd have to, you know, I wasn't sure if I was right, but I'd tell them, uh, I thought my, my calls were withheld in terms of family, not a solicitor. And then, you know, it's like you, you, you're just going back and forth every 45 minutes with someone. Or they'd say, yeah, sure, I'll check. And then they never come back. But finally, after a few hours, yeah, I, I did get a call uh, from a solicitor. And uh, they said that they would call me back in an hour uh, if they were able to successfully contact my family. So I waited in the cell and I waited in the cell and uh, nothing. So I, I asked if I could call. And then they took me to the box. It's like, they basically, they come to the cell, they open the door, uh, uh, they walk you down the hallway, and then there's a cubicle like with, you know, with the door, and, and there's, it's a bare room with a phone. So uh, I got on the phone with the lawyer, and they told me that they had tried to call um, you know, an hour or two hours ago, but uh, just didn't get through. Um, and then apparently they tried to call a second time. Uh, I don't know when, but uh, that also didn't get through. And in the morning... This is really interesting. So I got woken up by this noise. Uh, someone saying there's a call. And I was like, a call in the cell? Uh, I, I don't know where the voice was coming from. I think he came out of the sink. But um, <laughs> not really. And then, and then um, I, they said, it, 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 it's your lawyer. And then before I heard anything, you hear this robot saying, this call is being monitored. And I was like, hold on, that can't be right. You can't monitor a call between me and my lawyer. And, and the solicitor cut, you know, refused to take the call, just said no. And 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 uh, hung up. And so I I asked one of the guards, is it okay if I call the solicitor? You know, basically take me outside so I can do it privately. Never never happened. So I did get to speak to a solicitor, and you know they helped me. But there are also some moments that were really uh, you know uh, far from okay. Well, that sounds uh, very irregular. Have you spoken mm -hmm. to your parents um, about yeah. this? What do they think? <laughs> I mean. They're just happy uh, that I'm out, and um, yeah, uh, they well, you know, they. I guess they. Uh, um, I, yeah, they're just happy I'm out. That's it, really. Um, and we're also trying to figure out like what to do because, uh, again, you know, journalism is my livelihood, and I feel very passionately mm -hmm. about. Uh, what's happening and um, I'm afraid that anything I say you know can be used against me and uh, they, they've got this you know case hanging over my head so uh, you know I'm grateful for, for their support and, and for your support it's been overwhelming really I'm, I'm so so uh, uh, thankful because um, I don't say this like just as a cliche or something but it really isn't a, just about me it, it, this is they're trying to make an example out of me so it scares other people and they might start doing this to others too 
uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, it didn't even dawn on me for a while that I was arrested. I thought, I, you know, I was, I, my mind just like didn't grasp that I'd been actually arrested, not detained. I mean, which even being detained is bad enough, but you know, it's, uh, it's just good to be out. And yeah, I'm grateful for, for the support for, for my parents. They, they um, uh, have the same Richie, positions as me and yeah. Richie, has any of your funding been cut off or are people still able to look after you? Everything's all right, uh, thankfully. Yeah, oh, everything's good. okay. Yeah, yeah. You are not formally charged with anything, then. I mean, uh, no. So this is pre-charge bail, and uh, they might charge me at any second or in three months. I don't know. Well, do you really so. think they will? You see, I, well, in, in talking to Craig, I, I think that this is pure intimidation. I don't think they want. And Craig felt they didn't want to put a case like yours or even his previous in front of a jury. Especially when it deals with Gaza right now, there's a lot of popular uh, uh, opinion against what the British government is doing, and amongst other governments, in supporting that. So uh, I think it's intimidation. I don't think they're going. I that's my feeling. Of course, we never know that they just just trying to bother you and uh, scare you and to stop doing what you're doing. I don't think it's going to work. No, it's not. It's not going to work, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, that that you you know that stuff doesn't work on on us. Um, uh, I, I you know I had I held my head high the entire time I, I was I was um, I was just basically thinking of like what you know you would say what what Kathy would say what my mom would say what everyone would say I, and and I, and I knew that that people you know they, they perhaps didn't know in that moment yet what was going on but once they found out they they would uh, you know be supportive and so I I I felt like um, um, I mean I don't want to dramatize it or something like that but I felt like you know there was there was kind of a, a connection with you know me being in the cell and and the people being in the israeli cells of, although of course those conditions are a million 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 times worse and it's you know it's it's incomparable but just to, in terms of you know that we're we're in a global struggle against against uh, genocide and um that uh, yeah i i i'm again i i completely reject everything that the the police have said i think it's uh, outrageous and uh, even with their low low threshold it, it you're not i've i've done nothing wrong uh, but, uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I was, I was, um, I, I, I don't know how it's going to be from now on. Um, you know, uh, but, uh, I, you know, I'm not going to stop speaking out against, uh, what's happening in Palestine because it's, it's really the, the most chilling thing in our lifetimes. And I thought Iraq was bad. I mean, I, you know, I, I completely agree with that. Uh, the stronger and more influential our media gets, um, there's no reverse gear with these people. They become more repressive. Obviously, Julian's case, absolutely right, is can't get any worse than that. Uh, but they will not take what we're saying into consideration and realize they got to back off. They have to change after some reform. I've never seen this type of um, bloody mindedness in government before, and both sides of the Atlantic here and in Germany. And it's just unbelievable. Yeah. That also yeah, really. goes to show how much influence um, Israel has over all of these governments as well, directly, uh, as opposed to maybe other issues where they might not be willing to yeah. cross that line. I mean, under Obama, Obama administration wasn't willing to go after Assange. I mean, I think it takes a special degree of influence to kind of have them be this overtly authoritarian. So, Well, don't forget, Obama did try to frame him in uh, Obama's administration in Iceland, and it sure. didn't work. Right. right. So that's when they said, OK, First Amendment, we can't do it because <laughs> that failed because mm -hmm. the Icelandic judge, the interior minister threw the FBI out of Iceland where they were trying to set him up. So they tried to get yeah. him. But you're right. Yeah. Obama did not do it in the end. He didn't arm the Ukrainian government because he knew there were crazies there, which he meant as of and these types. Obama said this uh, on the record. He didn't want to give them. Um and yet we've seen now, of course, the subsequent governments, what they're doing. And it's just incredibly troubling. But um, yeah. at the public opinion, Richie, is really where this lies in the end, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, really. Um, and, and I think that's why it's important for, um, you know, all of the, the media to push back, whether we're, we're talking about Julian's case or we're talking about Craig being detained or Kit Clarenberg or David Miranda or Scott Ritter being raised. I mean, this is an assault on the press and, and and never mind what's happening in Gaza. I mean, you know, journalists being decapitated in Gaza. I mean, what, what is, what is the world coming to? I mean, am I, am I maybe a bit too naive that I, that I expected better? I mean, we're really not asking for much here, especially, you know, we're, we're, 
we are the countries that keep lecturing everybody about freedom, freedom of the press. We, we sure don't seem to have much respect for it. Um, you know, it's not worth much if you have to tell the government line. But, um, you, know, you know, it really is shocking what, what's happening everywhere. I mean, I, I thought that, um, uh, you know, I, I, you have to imagine, because I'm following what's happening in France, um, in French, I can, I can you know, I, I speak it fluently I, and I can hear how bad it is. And ironically, we're actually, how can I put this? Um, the, the French are actually like 20 years, I would say, uh, behind where we are right now because they're still stuck in this anti-Semitism phase. You know, like everything, every single critique is anti-Semitism. That's the only thing they discuss. Um, you know, everything is responded to, uh, or, or rather everything is, um, uh, you know, uh, every reply is, that's anti-Semitism. So we've actually come a long way, uh, I feel, um, because uh, that word used to be, you know, it, it used to stop all kinds of talk. Uh, but Germany, they've really, you know, they've started to show their, uh, their fascist colors uh, yet again. Um, the way they treat, I mean, some of the people in these protests, the, the videos that we've seen, it's, it's horrific. You know, it's like, it's the Gestapo. I mean, uh, and, and honestly, it's not just a German thing. I think it's unfair to just pile it on them. Because when I got taken off the plane, I felt like it was the Gestapo. They just had better suits. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, it, it's, it's really, um, it, this is not okay. This, this is really, really not okay. And it's it's not just, as I, as I said, it's not just in one country. We're witnessing it globally, as you said, on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah. Um, where is this, you know, wh where is this going? Uh, what, what's the conclusion? Because are they going to throw all of us in prison? Um, do they think they'll get away with that? Do they think, you know, everyone's going to shut up about the genocide? I think they've overplayed their hand. Um, and they're, they're, you know... It, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. Yeah. We're living in a world historical crime, this genocide. We're in a time of a genocide. And if you don't stand up against, this is your moment. This is the moment for everyone to yeah. show where you stand. And we're learning now. We always knew that the U.S. would support Israel unconditionally. But there was a thought, at least in the back of my head, that they could one day go too far and then they would have to. And they haven't cut off the support. No matter... The, how plain this is to anyone with a heart and a, and a mind and eyes to see. And they will continue to do that. And they've overplayed their hand there in the support. And now what they're trying to do to shut people like you up, which will not work. That's why I say it's the public, because they are growing more and more fed up with this. These guys have exposed themselves. It doesn't matter. It could be conservative or labor here. It's the same. Same as U.S. Republican, Democrat. They're both going to continue to support Israel at, no matter what they do. And they are digging their own political graves. Yeah. If there's anything that a politician will, they would, they throw their mother under a bus before they would try to lose an election. And yet they will not break their support for this country, no matter what it does. It's the most extraordinary thing. And you're standing on the right side here by speaking out, and we're going to suffer whatever consequences we have to, and you have suffered. But I just hope that they're just trying to intimidate, and they will. there's no case legally. This is not a terrorism case. Although that law is so draconian, it's even worse than the U.S. Espionage Act, the way it's written. It's shocking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it really is. But um, look... But yeah, when you look at some of the people who've come under attack, some of our best, and I'm not talking about a particular country. There's people in the US, there's people in the UK, but you personally have been asked to um, stand for a political party, and now you have also been <laughs> harassed, um, but you haven't been charged. So you must be doing something right, Richie. I wouldn't worry too much about it. That's what he said before. That's what he said. Yes. <laughs> and that is something that, you, you know, you, you could sleep at night. And I don't know about them, to be honest with you. Anyway, we're just veering off into uh, polemics Thank here. You. But I do appreciate you. your time with us, uh, Richie, and for sharing whatever you could with us. And, uh, and just know that there was a lot of people supporting you and they're outraged by what has happened. Yeah. And they keep speaking out about it. And we'll thank keep you so watching much. it very closely. Yeah. Thank you. It means the world to me. It really does. Thank you. I'm very okay. grateful. It's an honor to be here with you.